giving you a voice, making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. First Updates Now is able to create content thanks to viewers like you. We need your help to keep fun loud, live, and independent. Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Welcome to First Updates. Now I'm your host, Tyler Olds, and tonight we have Don Bozzi, past president, on to share his story, experiences, and to field your questions this evening. Uh, later on during the show, if you're watching live, one of you will have an opportunity to take on Don in some first trivia. I know you want to play this uh, for a jackpot of $50. So if you're interested in doing that, message at First Updates now here on Twitch with your phone number. And if you're selected, we will give you a call. Uh, of course, if you have any questions for uh, Don, lots to come with that. Uh, joining us tonight is our co-host. We have Nick Mathis, or of course, Nick Jr. as he's known. Welcome uh, back, Nick. <laughs> Hey, thanks, Tyler. And uh, like Tyler said earlier, if you guys have any questions for uh, Mr. Bosa that you would like to read during the show, tag First Updates Now in chat. Uh, we will get to as many as we can of your questions early in chat. Um, if you didn't already submit ahead of time, we do have some of those questions that you guys submitted already in there. Um, but like I, <clears throat> excuse me, like I said earlier, uh, Don Bosi is currently a general partner at Technology Virtue Partners. Uh, he has a PhD in electrical engineering from MIT, wow, um, and served as the president of FIRST from 2013 to 2019. Welcome, Don. It's great to have you on. Thank you, Nick, and thank you, Tyler. It's uh, great to be here and always fun to be with the FIRST community. Yeah, we appreciate you taking the time. Uh, and, and apparently we're not supposed to call you Dr. Don since you have the uh, PhD, right? So. Yeah, as I told you, I've, I've forgotten more than I remember, so... Uh, <laughs> Actually, the other funny thing is I noticed Nick said technology virtue partners. Uh, it's technology venture partners. So a lot of people would say there's nothing virtuous about venture, but. Uh... <laughs> Thanks for correcting me. Fair enough. And, and, you know, we'll definitely get into that, too, because I'd love to hear, uh, of course, what you're doing now. We're going to uh, chat. We're going to take us through a bit of a, a journey through Don. We'll call it that. Uh, it, it's like the uh, Disney World. You ride through the boat of Don's uh, first tenure as you go through. Uh, but we're going to start out kind of at the beginning uh, and then talk about, you know, of course, the years during first. Uh, and then, uh, of course, what Don is doing afterwards and what's he what's he doing now uh, with the uh, not virtue venture uh, as we go through. So, uh, Don, I want to start off by asking you, uh, you know, 2013, uh, you became the first president. Can you walk us through a little bit about uh, what were you doing before that and what led you into first uh, as you started out with us? Sure. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of luck and happenstance. Uh, so prior to first, of course, as you mentioned, I have a technical background and I had been a general manager uh, running businesses, small and large, uh, in the networking, communications and fiber optic space. Um, and from that, I uh, sort of took a small business and grew it into a pretty significant public company, uh, then got involved in the venture capital world, uh, both uh, helping to grow and support small companies, startups, as well as on a couple of occasions running those companies. And throughout that whole time period, you know, I realized it's always about the team. If you, if you hire and build a great team, uh, you know, that correlates much better with uh, very successful outcomes. And you know, what makes a great team is, is people who are not only technically competent, but have sort of the, the communication, the leadership, you know, the project management skills, um, kind of that whole, whole picture. So, um, you know, it, it was 2013. And, and literally, I always say my, my story is the least inspired and in all of first. Uh, one day, I got a call from a good friend of mine who happens to be a recruiter. And he calls me and he's like, Don, have you ever heard of first? And I'm like, you mean the robotics competition? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, yeah, I've heard of it. Uh, you know, the company I was with at the time, we sponsored a team, although I really didn't have much to do with it. Um, but I, you know, I knew about it because uh, one of the employee sons was on it and you know, I'd heard of it, but I really had had no experience with it. And he's like, well, they're looking for a president. And I immediately thought of you. And I'm like, why did you think of me? I don't know <laughs> anything about robots, uh, which is true. I really didn't. Yeah. Um, and, and his answer was uh, the same as I would give today. It's not about the robots. It's all about the kids. There you go. And I said, well, I don't know anything about them either, but I'm willing to give it a try. <laughs> You got a couple and kids so, you mentioned, though, right? Yeah, I do. I have one daughter uh, who's a linguistics major, yeah. um, although you know, she's pretty pretty good at math and science as well. 
Um, and she wasn't and so in first slowdown. She was never in first, and uh, you know, uh, so uh, and in fact, I I think she's been to a first event since then. But uh, she was already in college by the time I sure. took the role, so uh, not, it, wasn't, it wasn't like she was growing up while I was there. Um, and and they're really smart. Uh, they were doing the recruiting right around you know during the FRC season and leading up to championship. So uh, as they got talking to me about it, they're like, you have to get out, you have to attend an event. And I was living in Connecticut. And so uh, that weekend, there was an event in Hartford. And I went and my wife and I attended. And they told us, they're like, just walk the pit, talk to the kids, you know, uh, you will be interested to see what you think. And as we walked around and talked to the kids, and we began to see like, wow, not only are these kids, you know, very competent, very technically smart, uh, but they have really great you know, teamwork, communication, presentation skills. And it really hit home to me that these are the kind of people I always look to hire. And if there's an organization that could, could help develop kids in math that you know, have those kind of amazing skill sets, um, I thought it was pretty special and, and pretty impactful. So uh, as usual, it's the kids who are the best salespeople. They <laughs> lured me in right away. And uh, kind of the rest is history. But uh, so I went from zero to 100 in about 30 days. So so you were actually, um, when you initially were going through the recruitment process, that was also in 2013? You mentioned it was during the season, is that correct? Yep, yep. So as you were getting recruited, did you start to Im find yourself immersing yourself in what first was? Because you started in May, so that was directly after championships. Did you do anything to almost kind of vet the program yourself, say, hey, this is actually for me uh, during the during that competition season? Yeah, so um, literally, I think the first event I went to was in March. So it was like a 60-day, like coming up to speed. And um, they did actually, uh, they invited me to championship as well. So I had sort of this uh, generic VIP badge. And, and they said, no one knows who you are or why you're here. You can walk around and talk to anybody. Um, you know, I got to meet you know several of the board members and such. But you know, really, they just gave me a lot of free time to go watch the events. And I had a lot of, what is going on? What are they doing here? Why are they doing that? Um, but I just remember, you know, that everybody was like so nice and so gracious. And, you know, I, I remember actually a parent uh, from Wisconsin, no less, Tyler. Sure. Um, I, was, I was just sitting all by myself. And, and I was maybe a little overdressed for championship because, you know, I didn't I didn't know what it, you were supposed to yeah, wear. The hospitality lounge is not as fancy as some people might expect, but it's nice. And I, was, I wasn't there. I was literally just like in the nosebleed seat somewhere oh, sure. <laughs> next to a team, you know, and, and literally this, this parent uh, to one of the kids on this team who was from Wisconsin came up to me and he goes, I don't know who you are, why you're here. I see you're sitting here and you have this badge, you know, it's a VIP badge. So I assume you're somebody important. And I just want to tell you that this program has had such an amazing impact on, I don't remember if it was a daughter or a son, but, and, and, you know, he was just going on and on and then like introduced me to the kids and it was just really mind blowing that, you know, these parents would just randomly come up and talk about, you know, how great this experience has been and what it's meant for their kids, you know, not just in terms of learning technical skills, but, you know, being part of a team, um, being, you know, in a really exciting experience and just all the amazing opportunities that it created. So, I mean, that doesn't happen every day. So I thought that was, I knew there had to be something really, really special and, you know, everybody you talked to was saying the same thing. So it was just phenomenal. So something I, I do want to dive into, and we talked about a little bit about this pre-show, uh, obviously coming in 2013, for those who are familiar in 2012, uh, there was a famous, uh, for a colloquial term, we'll call it a hacking incident uh, that happened during that. So you get brought in as the president the year afterwards for that. Is there any sort of still kind of uh, remnants of the wake left behind from that when you take over? Or, uh, you know, as well, we also got a new FRC director at the time, acting FRC director as well, too. Uh, so you can talk to us a little bit about that. So, so realistically, uh, I've kind of heard it historically, but uh, that was kind of all handled before I got there to sure. some extent. Uh, so Frank was, was the FRC director when I got there. I think, I think they saved it for me to say officially he's the FRC director. Um, and I think Frank is amazing. Um, I worship the ground he walks on. Yeah, Frank's um, awesome. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, again, you know, I know the team was disappointed because it's sort of what happened is, you know, very much kind of against the ethos of first, um, you know, a big part of the ethos of first is gracious professionalism. 
And winning only means something when you win and your competitor is at their best. And so, you know, I think it was, I think, I mean, obviously there was a technical challenge and they wanted to make sure it couldn't happen again, but I, I think it also kind of shook the core a little bit, the ethos, but, you know, um, I think we moved beyond that quickly and nothing's ever foolproof, but, you know, Frank and his team uh, have done everything they can think of to, you know, try to prevent that from happening again. Now, there's a lot of creative people in our community, so uh, hopefully, hopefully no one gets any ideas, but, uh, I, you know, hopefully, hopefully people remember gracious professionalism and, and that kind of behavior is not consistent with it. Uh, All right, yeah. Real quick, by the way, oh, totally. somebody asked on um, what what we were talking about. Uh, you can search in chat later on. We did a full episode under Candidly Speaking, episode two. Uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about at least some of the perspective of people that were on the field, it's not necessarily verbatim what happened, but some new perspectives of that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, like Tyler said, that we got a we did a show on it, and we'll kind of leave it at that. So, uh, kind of moving forward, we had a question on Chief Del Five from uh, Little Underscore Lavery saying, uh, "Don, could you explain to viewers and uh, commenters the difference between uh, being the first president and the director of the first robotics competition?" As I know, sometimes that can kind of get uh, miscombobulated and that kind of thing. And there's some rules in between. I don't think people know about either. That's true. Um, so the director of first robotics competition is Frank Merrick, and I'm nowhere near as good looking as him or as witty. So. Um, no, Frank is more Frank hair. is awesome. So, <laughs> yes, yeah, true. Maybe a little more hair, but not much. Um, so, you know, as president of first, you're responsible for everything first. So the whole progression of programs, you know, from first Lego League to first tech challenge to first robotics competition, as well as, you know, everywhere in the world and such. So. Um, you know, in addition to having pro and, and so underneath uh, the president, there's a vice president of programs, which is uh, Chris Rake, uh, who joined us, I guess maybe it's about a year and a half ago now uh, from he was formerly with National Instruments. Um, and Chris is also amazing. Um, he, he has worked and volunteered prior to joining first headquarters. Uh, he actually had worked with every, all four of the first programs. So uh, he was early on partner for first Lego League in Austin, Texas. I think he coached his kids in first Lego League Junior. Um, he was the world judge advisor for first Tech Challenge, and he was actually the person who, when he worked for NI, you know, more than when he was at NI more than a decade ago, actually developed the. I guess at the time it was the C Rio controller for the first robotics competition. Uh, so oh. Chris is amazing, and Chris now leads. He's our VP of programs and has uh, oversight over all all the first programs from. Uh, you know, pre-kindergarten to, to uh, 12th grade. Uh, but then there's also uh, development, which is the fundraising aspects, um, you know, field operations, which uh, Erica Fessia runs, which is all of our partners, our program delivery partners and, uh, you know, local organizations. So uh, all of that rolls into FIRST. And Frank is responsible for the programmatic aspects of, of FIRST Robotics Competition. And I, I could just tell you there is no person that is more passionate and more committed to the success of first robotics competition than Frank. I wholeheartedly agree with that, Don. Uh, great words on that. Something I want to ask you a little bit is uh, you, you mentioned some of these other roles that a lot of people don't get a chance to see uh, in, in first regards to they're working on a Manchester remote uh, for things about how many, do you know about how many like full-time employees that uh, first actually has uh, running through. I know there's a lot of, you know, senior mentors and that sort of thing like that, but what about people who are kind of working more with Manchester directly? I think if I remember right, it's about 150. Sure. So oh, it's that's a lot pretty, more than I thought. Well, but it, you have what, a million people involved in the program? Well, so as I was going to say, is it's big on right. one hand, yeah. but then you figured <laughs> there's like, if there's 150 of them, but then there's, you know, about 150,000 volunteers Right. Um, and I think last season there was, you know, approaching 700,000 kids. So, oh my uh, gosh. it's, uh, I always, I always tell everybody, just, just imagine every day you're supporting a thousand volunteers, you know, mentors, coaches, event volunteers. So, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's actually a pretty, pretty efficient staff. How do you put a great all, group of folks. how do you put all that in the scope, you know, for yourself as the president saying, Hey, you know, we have, you know, as you just mentioned about 850,000 people that are involved in the program where do you look at things from uh you know this is where we are this is where we want to be can you, can you maybe talk to us a little bit about your vision um as you were president uh in regards to growth sustainability uh and how you looked at the different programs as well too i know it's a lot to take in at once but uh you know it, it's a huge program 
Yeah, no, that um, and it's huge on one scale. Like you look at it one way and you say, "Wow, that's big," and then you look at it another way and you say, "Wow, that's small." Yeah, that's um, right. Absolutely. And I, yeah. And I, I think you know part of what again what I spent a lot of time thinking about is you know how does every kid get access to these programs? Because um, I, I genuinely think every kid deserves access to these programs. Now they don't have to do it if they don't want to or whatever, but it, it would at least be nice if somehow, some way, there was a first program in every single school, you know, in every single country around the world, so that at least kids had access. And I know we have a lot of, you know, fantastic community-based teams, whole homeschool teams. So I love them and nothing, nothing wrong with that. But I always say, you know, for better or worse, schools are still, you know, the largest youth serving infrastructure in the world. And so much like soccer or football or hockey or gymnastics, you know, if every kid had access to this in their school, then at least you know they have the ability to participate if they're interested and and get exposure to it to to maybe decide if they like it. So, you know, even in the United States, I mean, I think we have a toehold in like about 20 percent of the school districts and we're only in I think it's about 10 percent of the schools. So there's a lot of kids out there who still don't have access, easy access to our programs. Um, and so we spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, how do you reach those kids? How do you grow? Um, but at the same time, sustainability is just as important. You know, it's one thing to get a team started, but it's another thing to keep it and, and to maintain it. And, um, you know, we, we understand that, you know, it's like we don't want to gain one here and lose one there. We want to keep one here and gain one there mm -hmm. uh, so that more kids have access. And so, you know, that that's tough. I will say the numbers are impressive. I, if I remember right, and you know, it's been a few months. But first robotics competition has about 95, 96 percent uh, sustainability. So every year, about 95, 96 percent of the teams come back. You know, we you know, our heart bleeds for the four or five percent we lose. And sometimes a team will take a year off and come back the next year. Um, so, you know, there are there are it's not always a loss. But, uh, we, you know, we do know. And, and part of what upsets me is a lot of the reason like it's hard for teams to sustain or, you know, where we lose teams is they don't always have great school support. Maybe they're at the school or, you know, they have space, but the school, you know, doesn't include them in the budget. They don't have access to buses, uh, the same types of things that, you know, every other sport seems to have. And so, you know, that was also a big part, uh, you know, something that I spent a lot of time on when I was at first was advocacy trying to make sure both the federal government understood the importance of a program like this and try to create financial support to schools to participate. Um, but then you learn a lot of the education budgets actually at the state and local level. So figuring how, how do we help um, you know, our state level organizations do advocacy at the state level, um, right. and even you know, pitching to boards of education and stuff. So uh, we know the sustainability is a challenge, but uh, you know, first is all about overcoming challenges. So uh and wish, and you, wish we had more school support for that. Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned, though, in regards to, you know, FRC having that, that 95, 96, 95 percent sustainability. Did, did you, did first, does first look at FRC as kind of the barometer in regards to that? Because in my opinion, looking at FRC, uh, that, it, that has a larger mix of school support teams versus like FTC or FLL where a lot of times I would equivalent that more closer to a, like a girl or boy scout troop would be in many cases, yep. because it, it's, you know, once your kid graduates, I think that has a bigger uh, reduction in how many in sustainability than what maybe FRC does. That's exactly true. And if I remember FTC, I think is somewhere in the 83, 84% sustainability. And two things we saw there, FTC, you know, could be kind of more like a parent or a neighborhood, you know, they did it while their kids were in it. But then and then that's actually why we like it at the school is when the kids graduate, hopefully the team is still there and a new crop of kids comes in. Um, but the other thing we found with FTC, because, you know, it's smaller teams, one year a school might have 60 kids sign up. So they do six teams and the next year, maybe 52 express interest. So they have five teams. Yeah. So there's a little more up and down with with FTC numbers uh, than you know FRC. Typically, there's one or maybe two at a school. First Lego League is definitely along the lines of what you described, where you know a lot of Girl Scout teams, a lot of Boy Scout teams, a lot of community teams, and sometimes they do tend to come and go with with the kids. It's a lower barrier of entry though, too, right? At the same time. Yep. 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 And it's much much larger. I mean. Uh, 
believe it or not, I think if you look overall, I think about two thirds of the kids who participate in first are actually in some version of first Lego league. Hmm. Very interesting to hear. Um, looking at uh, one of the things too is you know you talked about uh, your involvement with with government right at a federal level. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about uh, that and also from an international standpoint. You know, obviously, first is in many many countries, especially you know for for our viewers we you know take out FRC, FTC, and FLO are in many many more countries than what uh, FRC is. So. Uh, how how does the growth and sustainability and all the the ridiculous amount of facets that go into working with different governments from different countries? Can you describe to us some of your experience with that? Yeah, no, and actually, I'd say one of the most exciting things during my period was sort of the the amount of growth we saw internationally, yeah. and it's probably actually been stronger uh, than in the United States the last couple of years. Um, you know, I think I'm trying to remember back, but I even think the Mexico regionals, the Australia, you know, Turkey's regional had a lot of growth, China, Turkey's had a lot of growth, Israel, um, and Israel then went district. Yeah. So, um, I think Taiwan was supposed to come on this year. China had no shortage of challenges and, uh, not, not anything to do with our partners there, but, uh, the government throwing interesting, uh, mm -hmm. regulations in the mix. Right. Um, and that's where I say is it's, it's kind of funny because I know it was a joke because uh, sometimes people will tell me like, oh, it's so hard to do first here in the United States. I'm like, well, let me tell you what it's like <laughs> doing it in China or in Australia right. because Absolutely. yeah, they yeah. face or a country really where the American dollar struggle. doesn't go as far. <laughs> exactly. One year Very Turkey nice had phenomenal inflation and, you know, so ours was priced in U.S. dollars and suddenly – you know, the number of Turkish lira that the equivalent was like sky high. And, you know, again, super kudos to the Burchard family and the Fukret Excel Foundation that's our partner over there. Um, I mean, they did amazing things, but the growth rate in Turkey has been phenomenal. Um, and, you know, the kids there that, I mean, they get so much out of the program. And, uh, you know, that's why I say is it's, it's interesting. It's a challenge everywhere. Uh, but, uh, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. And first is made up of a lot of very creative, determined people. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Don, really quick on the uh, on the notion of, uh, you know, when you said you were working with working with like the state and local governments to try and get funding, you know, being in Michigan, that's kind of um, we're kind of one of the really the first states that we were able to really get support from our state government and um, I know multiple teams around, you know, kind of where I'm at and including my, you know, my few teams that, you know, we rely on, you know, some of that funding that does come from the state of Michigan. And, you know, I know a big worry right now with, uh, you know, this COVID-19 stuff going on is that if there is a first season that happens next year, you know, um, the education budgets kind of around the country are getting slashed. And, you know, we're worried that, you know, our first robotics funding is going to be one of the first ones to go. So, um, but yeah, just kind of, you know, kind of moving on. Uh, we got one more, um, question. I will, from... I, I will say, you know, Michigan has done a phenomenal job and, and really kudos. And, you know, we, we, we use them as an example to a lot of other state governments, but I also say, you know, a good, good thing to learn in business is diversify your funding sources. Mm, absolutely. <laughs> and, yep. Yeah. It's sort of one of those, like, yeah, you love having a customer that grows so fast that they become 80% of your business, but, uh, you know, they once catch they, a cold and you, fall, you right. die of pneumonia. So, uh, yeah, exactly. So it's yep. always, always good to kind of keep in mind, you know, it's great when times are good and, but you know, it's always valuable to diversify, you know, bring in new sponsors, new supporters, cause, uh, they need the talent. So. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So um, kind of uh, moving on here, we got a question from Chief Delphi from the username KRF. Uh, Don, what changes were you uh, most proud of happening during your tenure as uh, president of FIRST? Um, so, I, I mean, again, I'd say a lot of it, um, you know, I, I touched on one is I, I, you know, I think a very interesting part of FIRST is the international aspect and bringing kids from all over the world together um, and letting them see what they have in common and getting them to, you know, giving them an opportunity to know each other and, and kind of to have that bond. Uh, so I am really proud of kind of all the work we did there. Um, the other thing I would say is, uh, you know, I think we really tried to build the progression of programs and, um, you know, they're all, all three great programs, four programs beforehand, and they're all very, very good, but they really operated independently and there wasn't a lot of like knitting between them. And so, you know, now 
we've tried to sort of make them complement each other better. Uh, we have kind of a unified season theme and such, which, you know, our great friends at Disney Imagineering have, have really helped and the folks at Lucas Films and such. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of kind of how the way it, I hope it became a kind of more integrated progression. Um, certainly our goal is to get kids involved in pre-kindergarten and uh, keep them involved through high school and even into the alumni association. So. One thing I want to, I want to follow up on is that you, you brought about the progression of programs. And I think if we look uh, back before your time uh, in, and I've been in first for a long time is that that really never existed. It truly never did. Right. There wasn't um, this, this kind of this conjunction between it. Um, and I think that the more actually started in the more recent years where it truly got to be fully integrated like that. But can you talk to us a little about uh, why one that was important for you to do and really what went behind that? I mean, if you look back a few years ago, it used to be, Hey, here's a Frisbee game. Here's a basketball game. You know, here's a volleyball game. Here's, you know, a, a game where you put, you know, tubes on pegs if you're FRC. Similar things for right. the other programs as well. How did that full kind of that integration package come together? And why was that important uh, for FIRST to do? Yeah, so, you know, again, part of it, I, I think early on we realized, um, you know, our greatest asset was the fact that we had this really strong set of programs that went all the way from PK through 12. And again, part of our thought process was, how do we get school districts you know, as opposed to us encouraging them to do this, how do we turn it around and get them actually begging us to bring it into their schools, yeah. right? Yeah. And and most yeah, superintendents, not all of them, but most, you know, have K through 12. And and so, and in fact, we saw it in Michigan a lot, you know, uh, a lot of superintendents would be like, this program's fantastic. You know, what do you got for my middle schoolers? What do you got for my elementary right. schoolers? And so, you know, we realized that, you know, every kid, knock on wood, hopefully grows from age six to age 18. Um, and, and we also realized the earlier we can get them engaged, the better chance we are to get them to stick, right? And so, mm -hmm. especially as you try to reach out to a more diverse audience, you know, girls, people of color, a lot of times as they grow up, you know, society tells them like, oh, you know, that's not for you or that's, and so we thought the sooner we can reach them and, and help them understand, no, you are good at this. This can be fun. You are welcome. You know, we want you to be part of this. The sooner we can reach them and hook them, the better we can keep them you know, moving through the progression. And we wanted to make it easy for them to progress from one program to the next to the next and kind of the way the skills built. So that was kind of the, the, the big idea behind it. And, and then, of course, the Disney Imagineers said to, you know, said to us like, well, and, and if you think about it, like technically the game is skinned different and, and it's kind of talked about a little different, but if you look at what people are doing, it's still throwing balls through holes yeah. or, you know, right. lifting like in all honesty, the, the, the actual mechanicalness of the game is, is all not all that different. It's just not necessarily skinned as like a sport that no one can truly understand. Um, but trying to put it into more of a story context and, uh, you yeah, know, the Disney Imagineers made it fun to do that and also made it fun to kind of connect the dots so that hopefully, you know, the big kids would be interested in what the little kids are doing because that makes them feel cool. And the little kids were interested in what the big kids were doing so that that inspires them uh, to stick with the program and go on and keep building their skills. What do, what do you think needs to be done more uh, in regards to the, the programs or what is maybe something you wish uh, was maybe done differently or you could see improved upon in, in regards to the collaboration between uh, the different programs and those who are involved in it? Because a lot of, you know, as you mentioned, uh, I mean, I'll, maybe a little antidote is I, I, I helped out with the Girl Scouts for, for some time. A lot of my good friends work there and, and they truly do state when fourth grade hits, boom, they go off in many different directions, right? And uh, so we, you know, we obviously still see that with first Lego leaguers, not going to an FTC, not going to FRC or not even knowing what it is in many cases. Um, so how do you, you know, what, what would you like to see in the future, uh, improved or what are ways or recommendations you'd give to say, Hey, uh, let's truly make all these programs together so we can get a kid that is pre-K all the way through 12th grade and beyond, uh, involved in first. Yeah. So there's two things that I would say, um, I, I suspect they're still happening and, and, you know, we're very much uh, stuff that we were doing when I was there. The first again is, is try to get superintendents to buy in and bring the full progression into their schools. Sure. And, and honestly, it's much less intimidating for a superintendent to say, let's start with first Lego league junior, or let's start with first Lego league. So um, a lot of times, you know, I'd say, you know, a lot of teachers, one of the things we had to do for teachers and, and superintendents in a lot of cases was help, connect the dots between what we're doing 
and what they're there to do, right? So, you know, we got to kind of make it understand, like, this isn't the tiddlywinks club, you know, what what we're doing, while it's kind of couched as a sport, and it's a lot of fun, and it's an after school activity, it's really supporting a lot of, the uh, you know, the goals and objectives that they're trying to get, achieve in the classroom, all the way from teaching math and science and communication skills to teaching a lot of the, I guess they're called 21st century skills, you know, mm-hmm. the soft skills, the, the collaboration, the teamwork, the presentation skills that, you know, sometimes is very hard to get in a traditional curriculum. So we really worked hard to try to connect that for educators to help them understand, yes, it's fun. Yes, it's a game. Yes, maybe you think of it as an after school activity, but realistically the kids are learning a ton. And, and because they get excited about it here, they're more open to learning the stuff, you know, all of a sudden they understand like, oh, that's why I need to know the Pythagorean theorem. Well, now that I have an interest or a need, then maybe I'll learn it as opposed to like, who the heck knows why we're learning this. Right. So um, I always say, if you put the inspiration first, the education will come. And so we tried to help educators understand that. And, and we're hoping that that, you know, leads them to start to pull the programs into the schools. Additionally, um, program that Erica Fessy is leading as part of our field operations is what we call coherent growth oriented ecosystem. So a lot of times when we operate as independent programs, there'd be a first Lego league partner and there'd be a first tech challenge partner and there'd be a first robotics partner. And sometimes they talked, sometimes they didn't, you know, they didn't have to, nothing forced them to. Um, and, and most of the time they did, but, you know, we're trying to encourage them to be kind of one more in, integrated whole. So they think about, you know, I'm using the volunteers on this weekend because the same volunteers can judge at a first Lego League event, and judge at a first Tech Challenge event the next weekend, right? So sort of trying to create kind of more collaboration, more cohesiveness between not just the programs, but also the delivery partners, you know, in any geography and such. And, you know, in some places like Michigan, it's all under one partner. And so it makes the coordination a little easier. In some other states, we have multiple partners, and they're all great because they bring something different to the table, but, you know, they don't necessarily uh, overlap or, you mm-hmm. know, interact as much. And so trying to create ways to make it so that, you know, they, they have a, a structure for, for interacting and coordinating um, and to make it easier both for the kids and the volunteers to support the whole progression. So let's uh, shift gears just a little bit here. And, and if you're watching live in chat, a uh, couple things to wind up with. Uh, we'll be talking down for a little bit more. Of course, we'll be trying to take some of your questions. We'll, we'll definitely make some time for that as we get through some of our pre-submitted questions uh, and to you. And if you're interested in playing trivia against Don a little bit later on, Don told me he studied all night last night uh, to make sure uh, up on first, make sure he was in good shape. So, But if you're interested in that, <laughs> shoot. First update's now a message here on Twitch uh, with your phone number, and uh, we might call you so you can play against Don for $50. Um, so Don, I, I want to talk about uh, a couple other things that, uh, especially over the last few years that I saw, and I know we had some questions with that, so I'm going to read off a question from uh, uh, Priya on this, uh, saying, uh, what is First HQ doing to push forward towards more uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, in the first community at large. And I just want to preface saying that, you know, if you look at the last couple of years, you know, we've seen things with the implementation of quiet rooms. We've seen much more in regards to support to the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, of course, first supporting Black Lives Matter, which I, I know in regards to that specific context is a little bit after your time, not saying you don't support that by any means, but, uh, yeah. you know, so as you looked at the last few years, why, why has that become a good focal point uh, in first in regards to that? Yeah, no, I think, and again, actually, it's probably one of the things that, you know, I'm, I'm proud of the progress we've made. We've got a long way to go. Um, but, you know, I think the a basic tenant of FIRST is inclusion. And, you know, I think it's it's really an environment where, you know, we try to sort of make everybody feel like you can contribute, you have value to add, um, and that's really an important part of, of the ethos of FIRST. And so um, it's always been kind of core to who we are. Uh, but I think in the last couple of years, we really thought about, you know, just saying that is one thing, but but what can you do to to, to turn that into a reality? And as, as you indicated, you know, inclusion and equity and diversity are a lot of different fronts. Um, some of them are visible, you know, boys, girls, people of color, uh, but there's a lot of other areas, you know, kids with learning disabilities, um, you know, uh, folks, uh, the LGBTQ plus community. And so, you know, looking at someone you don't know, 
but how do you create an environment that's open and welcoming? And so, you know, we've done quite a few things and I know there's a lot more that's being done and being looked at, uh, but a lot of training has been developed uh, for, for teams to think about, you know, what might they be doing that, uh, you know, A, they could be, you know, more proactively trying to recruit more diverse kids, but at the same time, you know, making sure that when kids show up uh, that they feel welcome. I, I always say, truly the front door of first is that team meeting. You know, um, most people in first never meet me, probably never meet anyone for first headquarters, um, but certainly, you know, they meet someone who's coaching or mentoring a team or their teammates. And so how do we give everybody the tools, the training, the skills? Um, and it's, you know, it's hard. I mean, and, and so I, part of the training is even sort of self-discovery about your own unconscious biases and things you may you may think, but not even realize you you think. And and uh, so it's you know I, I think we're no different than society as a whole. That we've got a, a lot of opportunity to improve in that regard. Uh, but I think the fact that it builds upon an ethos in first that's very much about inclusion. Um, I'm trying to think of how to say this, um, and hopefully I won't offend anybody with this. But I always I always remember this is a, to quote a first kid, um, and it was probably my first or second year. I was talking to somebody and, you know, I was talking about how it's great that, you know, we, we let all these kids in. And, and when one kid goes to me, well, who are we to call anybody an oddball and misfit? We're all a bunch of oddball and misfits <laughs> ourselves. So, and, and I definitely don't think and, and we're damn kids proud are oddballs of it, so. and misfits. Yeah, but uh, and I, I thought it was really refreshing that the yes. kids, I think, you know, and again, whether, you know, we've all been bullied, we've all felt outside and, and I really encourage everybody to think about, you know, especially, you know, we're in August, you know, knock on wood, somehow there will be team meetings, virtual team meetings, real team meetings coming up. Think about that first team meeting and, and think about, you know, all the kids who maybe show up for the first time. They don't know if they're going to like it or not. They don't they don't know anybody on the team. Maybe there's nobody there that looks like them. Um, you know, think about how tough that moment is for them and what a big difference it can make when you reach out and say, hey, I'm glad you're here. If you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask me. Um, I know we all feel that way, and sometimes we're just shy and don't think to say it, um, but it's a great time of the year to really kind of go the extra mile, you know, put out your virtual hand and, and welcome people because um, I think it's in all of our hearts, and, and the more we take what's in our heart and turn it into what, what we do in person or virtually, um, I think it can make a really, really big difference. And this is definitely a good time of year to think about that. Yeah, absolutely. And Don, on that note of, you know, kind of pulling, you know, kids out of their shells and that kind of thing, I've had probably about three or four kids now. So, I mean, kind of a, or three or four kids on my team. I, I have not had kids, <laughs> um, but kind of a background. I graduated in 2018. And then right after I graduated high school, um, I accepted the head coaching position of the team that I was on. So um, I've been doing, you know, that since then. Um, but I've had probably three or four parents that have came up to me either after the season or in the middle of the season that said, you know, my my child was really um, kind of an introvert and really, you know, wasn't very social or anything and really needed something to, you know, kind of uplift um, them. And the, you know, the, the what, what, at least what I'm doing and the program that we have going at my school, I know for a fact has completely changed kids socially and emotionally for the better um, in the, you know, in that sense. So that is absolutely true. And yeah, I'm, that's what tells me we're doing something right because I hear that story, you know, from many different places and uh, it warms my heart every time. Is the thing I love the most about first is the fact that it, it is having that kind of impact and and sometimes you don't even know, you know, the impact it's having just because you know you kind of take it for granted. But uh, it really giving kids a sense of belonging. I mean, the teenage years and younger are tough, right? And, right. And so feeling like you have a place where you can belong, where you're accepted for who you are. Um, that's really, really important. And, and so, you know, whoop, just lost one. I told Tyler. We, we no, were just I talking about that. <laughs> Found can, it. can work out with them, but you can't be in a long, long form podcast with them. So. I was going to say, I'm getting too excited about first. 
Uh, so, Don, uh, a couple things. We're going to play a little bit of speed round on these, I think, um, because we definitely want to get the trivia uh, before the top of the hour on here. Um, so this this one I know it's a big question, so I apologize about seeing a little bit of speed around with this, but you mentioned in regards to uh, a lot of people maybe not have, didn't have a chance to meet you or a lot of people are at Manchester. So let's talk about two championships here a little bit and uh, looking, you know, back in uh, 2017, when that decision was made to go to two championships uh, without diving, I guess, too much into it. A lot of it, I think has been said by you and, and elders in, in many different forms of media. Uh, can you just give a little bit behind the two championships and something I asked you before the show, I'd love to hear a bit more about the logistics of trying to actually run two championships and what that's like as well. Yeah, no, great question. Um, it, and really the, the driving factor behind two championships was to give more kids the opportunity to come to championship. Um, so many kids have told me how life changing it is. I mean, it's great to go to a regional event or a district event and you see these teams, but I, I really do think that there's something awe inspiring about walking into championship where there's, you know, tens of thousands of kids from all over the world, you know, with the same passion, the same excitement you have, um, you know, that are all really world, world class. And so, you know, very much. And, and, you know, somebody said, what, I think, or maybe you said, you know, what's the hardest thing I've ever done at first. And the hardest challenge of being a first president is, of course, you're trying to lead and you know, serve a big community. Um, but you also have to think about the people that aren't yet in the community, right? So you have to, like, you have to think about balance the needs of, well, how do I make it so it's attractive and easy for people to get involved? And yet at the same time, make sure it's a great experience for the people who are already involved. And, and, you know, I think, that was a little bit of the agita that the community felt with championship is, well, we really like it this way and it's great. Um, you know, we go every year and we see all our best friends and it's like, that is fantastic for you. But what about the teams that never get the chance to go there? Sure. Or what about a team that's new? And so, you know, a, a lot of, a lot of the thought was around how do we give more kids access to that kind of incredible experience? And also, you know, how do we geographically separate them so that hopefully, you know, overall teams don't have to travel quite as far. Um, now, for the international team, maybe someday we'll get big enough that we'll have, you know, a Europe and an Asia championship as well. Who knows? Uh, don't take that as any prediction. And then we can bring them all together for the festival. Festival of champions. There we go. Um, but but I, I will also tell you um, – it wasn't because like we at first headquarters wanted twice the work. Um, yeah. One championship yeah, right. is a lot of work. Two championships back to back is, is about, you know, kind of like, uh, that's crazy. It's sort of like the ultra marathon. Um, but so, you know, we, we think it's worth it for, for kids to have the experience. The one thing I will ask you though, is that I think for FRC, there's been a huge amount, but I, I did see a couple of comments in chat. FTC and FLL do have many less teams that actually advance, even though there are, uh, in many cases, more in FLL, many more teams uh, for that. Can you talk a little about, you know, why are there so many more FRC teams than maybe FTC or FLL uh, that go to the yeah. World Championships? Yeah, that's a great question. So FLL, um, there's a gazillion teams all over the world. So, uh, well, not exactly a gazillion, but a big number. It's getting there. A very uh, big number. <laughs> it's a very big number. Um, and, and we recognize that, like, only, you know, a tiny drop of those get to come to the World Championships. Um, that said, our partners also put on these amazing open invitationals. Uh, there's usually like three or four, mm -hmm. maybe five of those each year. So, you know, part of it is at that age, you know, we think kind of getting the opportunity to go to those is great. Um, but there's more than just championship that's available to, to those teams. Um, we really do think there is something solidifying at the high school level. And that's why, you know, for first tech challenge, first robotics competition, we think kind of kids going on that trip, kind of seeing these kids from all over the world. Also, you know, honestly, the scholarship row there is, is really important to, yeah. you know, give them exposure to like, hey, you know, here's all these colleges here recruiting. And a lot of the companies that are there too, honestly. And a lot of the companies. And I, I, I think it was uh, one year FedEx hired somebody right at their booth at, uh, at the innovation fair. That's and so, <laughs> um, yeah, I was going to say. So, you know, it is a little bit skewed more towards the older kids. Um, and FTC, I believe, um, actually, we've we've doubled, we've more than doubled the number of teams that can attend. So uh, we keep bumping up, uh, or at least we've been bumping up the sure. number of FTC teams that can attend. But, uh, you know, it is, a, it is a higher scale program, so it's a smaller percentage that get to go. 
Sure. Um, we're going to go through, a, as mentioned, a bit of speed around here. We just have some more kind of uh, random off the cuff questions that have been submitted. Uh, but we'll, if you don't mind, we'll take these kind of quick uh, as we go through. So, Nick, I'll let you let you grab the first one here. Yeah. So, um, again, from KRF and Chief Delphi, uh, Don, what visit to a competition or team was the most unique or memorable for you? Um, so they're all really uh, memorable in their own way. I would say um, if I had to pick one, I really loved going to, uh, it was a, originally a regional event, now the district championship in Israel for first robotics competition. Mm. Yeah, it is awesome. very, very really cool know. to see, you know, kids, you know, Jewish kids, Palestinian kids, Bedouin kids, kids from all different communities and backgrounds that on most days don't always get along. Uh, the kids are fine, but the communities don't always get along. Um, and kind of seeing them all like singing and dancing and just being friends and just being kids and just being humans um, and, and loving robotics. So uh, I, I would say that's probably the most memorable experience. Tyler? Yeah, I had a question from uh, Marshall uh, asking about uh, alumni on the first board of directors. There has not been a first alumni on the first board of directors. In, in your opinion, obviously, you're not president and necessarily control anything in the first board of directors. Uh, but do you think that could be something that uh, would happen in the future? Yeah, I, I mean, again, I, I have no control over yeah. it. Uh, but, you know, there's obviously a lot of incredibly impressive and, and very accomplished uh, first alumni out there. So I would say you know, down the road, and there's also the executive advisory board, um, which which honestly you know is also a little bit more hands-on that Kevin Ross uh, out of Washington uh, chairs. Um, that's a, another great way for alumni to you know an alumni representative to maybe get involved and sort of share their perspective. Uh, but I also know Michelle Long does a lot with uh, alumni advisory councils and such. And believe it or not, uh, I hope you believe it. Um, I, I know, you know, first headquarters listens to them a lot. So uh, we, we do value uh, alumni's input and there's, there's multiple different channels for that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So next question from Skyhawk. Uh, what was your favorite game piece or game element from any time in FRC or FTC? Um, so I, I think it's always, uh, maybe there's this thing your first always has a special place in your heart. Uh, but my first season uh, was Aerial Assist, um, a, and I thought it was a great game. game. <laughs> I thought it was a lot of fun. Now, granted, it didn't have all the like the magic of Disney or whatever, uh, but I thought it was a really great game, and I still remember the finals and the St. Louis Championship uh, sitting there watching it. Um, and, and maybe it was just because I got, you know, Frank and the team invited me to game design, and it was game design is so hard. Um, oh, I can't I even imagine. It doesn't seem like it, but, you know, the team really thinks about how do we make sure like that a rookie team that, you know, shows up with a box of parts can do something and, and accomplish something. And, you know, and yet at the same time, uh, I guess one person described it as low floors, high ceilings and wide walls. Like there's <laughs> just a lot of opportunity, you know, for teams of all different backgrounds and skill sets. And um, you learn just they could they could write a book about just the whole challenges of game design and all the things they think about. And I was just in awe at how much the team thinks about. And I spent a lot of time with them on aerial assist. We could quite really easily do a full show on that as well, too, I'm sure. So, right. yeah, and, and we have actually had, uh, I know in the past people have been uh, in either part of the review board uh, or GDC on. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's incredibly hard and it's in it, the dedication that gets put into that, uh, in many cases, you know, I think this past year it's been very well received in FRC and FTC uh, and, and FLL, and uh, but I'm sure there's years like you know, maybe 2015 that you know have been received. Hey, a little don't bit hate different. on it, Tyler. I, Nick likes it, but that's. Uh, <laughs> oh, was that so. the was that the trash can year? Yeah, yeah, so. it was. <laughs> See, we already forgot about it. So, all right. Now, the truth is, it's probably the most like like think about like a great a, engineering you know, an Amazon robotic warehouse. That game was probably teaching you really the skills you yes. need to work right. there to design that, but. But, uh, Absolutely. May not have had the glamour. All right. Uh, last question here before we start. Uh, before we go and start trivia, and then at the end we'll just wrap up with a few questions on what you're doing now. Uh, from a cash uh, asking, uh, how often have you been mistaken for our vice president? <laughs> um, so uh, a few people have pointed out. I will tell you that one time uh, I was in Washington D.C. and I was staying at a Hilton Garden Inn not too far from the White House, and. Uh, I came back from whatever it was, it was probably nine o'clock at night. It was dark out and I walk in the lobby and the bellboy comes running up to me, like thinking like the vice president just walked in. 
<laughs> and then he realized like, oh, you're not, you're not the vice president. And he kind of, he said something, but, and I thought to myself, yeah, like the vice president's just going to stroll into a Hilton Garden Inn. <laughs> <laughs> It was, it was not the nicest Hilton Garden Inn in the world, but uh, so that, that was probably the only time that someone physically mistook me for the president. Oh, I... that's funny, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, all right, Tyler, so how are we doing? With that said, sorry about that. With that said, we just are bringing on our trivia caller here. Um, so we're going to be bringing on uh, Wilson, also known as Bacon One Four Two One Two, to play some trivia against Don here. Wilson, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Awesome, man. So, um, so, and you're on FTC one four two one two. Is that correct? Yep. Awesome. You ready to play some trivia against Don? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. Let's explain how it works um, before we uh, send Don away for just a moment on here. So, it's going to be five questions that we have, uh, mostly first related. So, like I said, hopefully Don studied up a little bit on this. Uh, but five questions, uh, answer as quickly as you can. Uh, you can pass once, uh, and then we'll come back to you again. If you pass a second time, uh, then we're just going to take pass as an answer. If you say, I don't know, we're going to take that as an answer as well. You need to go as quickly as possible because time is a factor here. Um, and if I hear that typing in the background, Bacon, I know you're on Google, <laughs> so none of that, okay? <laughs> yeah, calling you out right Trust there. Me, we, we, know when that, fair and square. we know when that happens, man, so... Uh, so you got to be quick with this. Once again, uh, always we will disqualify you. And don't do it against the president, the ex-president first. He knows people. So uh, so with that said, uh, like I said, five questions as we go through. Uh, and we're going to actually ask Don, if you don't mind, do you mind just removing your headphones or putting on mute for a second so you can't hear the questions? Yep. And then I'll give you a big wave when we need to come back to you. Sounds good. All right. We'll see Don in just a minute here. And with that said, let's start our trivia and go through. And with that said, Wilson, Bacon, are you ready? No throwing. All right. In three, two, one. What year did first teams kick off the annual Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade? All right. Name the second location that the first championship was held. On Sunday... What was the name of the SpaceX spacecraft that returned astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley back to Earth? What was the name of this year's first LEGO League game challenge that was just released today? What year did FRC teams get assigned a permanent number? What year did first teams kick off the annual Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade? 2010. Name the second location that the first championship was held. Detroit. All right, and what is the name of this year's first Lego League game challenge? All right, and time. All right, we're gonna bring Don back in on here and see how he did. Bacon, how do you feel you did? Fine. Fine, all right, well, Don, not too confident from Wilson here, but we'll see uh, how you do in the next questions. Don, are you ready? Sure. <laughs> all right, and they're, they're a little tough, by the way. So in three, <sighs> two, one. What year did first teams kick off the annual Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade? 2014. Name the second location that the first championship was held. Houston. On Sunday, what was the name of SpaceX spacecraft that returned astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley back to Earth? Oh, pass. I saw it. What, what is the name of this year's first LEGO League game challenge called? Um, hmm, uh, pass. What year did FRC teams get assigned their permanent number? Oh, that was early. Uh, 1999. On Sunday, what was the name of the SpaceX spacecraft that returned astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley back to Earth? 
I forget. I have no clue. And what is the name of this year's first Lego League Challenge game? Ah. I know what the season's called, but I'm trying to think what the... Um... It did just get released today, so... I know. No, but that's right. <laughs> I'm going to pass. All right. I knew seven months ago. (laughs) Time. (laughs) All right. We're going to bring in Wilson back here. We'll go through these. Uh, Any of the ones with the years, we take who is closest in these so we can assign points uh, just in case. So let's start with our first question. It might have been 2013. After I said it, I think it might have been 2013. For for which one? Macy's Day Parade. Well, it is true that in Macy's Day Thanksgiving Parade, uh, Bacon said 2010. Don said 2014. It is 2013. That does give you a point, though, Don, for being closest. Um, yeah, it was my first Thanksgiving at first. <laughs> so one nothing currently for Don. Uh, name the second location of the first championship was held. The answer is actually Epcot because it was first. The first first championship was held in the high school gymnasium. Uh, so Epcot was the answer. Bacon said Detroit. Don said Houston. One nothing currently for Don. On Sunday. What was the name of the SpaceX spacecraft that returned astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley back to Earth? Uh, Bacon said Kraken. Don said Pass. Um, and then I didn't. I think I think we had Pass for the second one, right? Uh, yeah. It was uh, the Dragon. Uh, dragon. Was the answer. Close for Kraken. Still one nothing for Bacon. Bacon's typing away frantically to verify that's the truth. So what was the name of this year's first Lego League game <laughs> challenge? We had passes on both sides. It was Replay. Uh, that. One nothing. And what year did FRC teams get assigned their permanent number? Bacon said 2009. Don said 1999. 1998 is the answer. It does give Don the point, and Don takes it. Two wow. nothing. There's celebration music playing on in the background that you can't hear, the way, by the way, Don, but big music going on <laughs> uh, for you uh, as a celebration. Bacon, thank you so much for playing. Uh, that means uh, tomorrow for our FTC live, it's going to go up to $60. Thanks, Bacon. All right. With that said, that's uh, that's for trivia. We're going to be wrapping up here in just a little bit. But Dom, before we let you go tonight, we're going to ask you what's going on now. Can you talk more about uh, the company you're with right now as as a partner? What does that mean? And uh, we got a couple of questions to wrap you up with too. Sure. So um, I'm sort of back with the group I was with prior to joining First, uh, which is a venture capital firm. Um, and as I said, you know, we we raise funds and then uh, use those to invest in uh, promising technology startups. So, uh, uh, you know, we invest in companies that do a whole host of, uh, I guess, we're not super early stage investors. Uh, we're kind of people who where companies kind of gotten established and has an idea and maybe a product and some early revenues. And then we help them scale and grow and meet market demand. Um, and so, you know, we're working in clean energy, we're working in communications, um, we're working in displays and optics, so uh, a whole, whole host of different things. Uh, but what's really exciting to me is it's, it's back to kind of supporting entrepreneurs um, and looking at the kind of entrepreneurs, you know, looking for the kind of entrepreneurs that first creates, uh, not just people who have great technical ideas or great product ideas, but know how to lead teams, know how to communicate, know how to share their passion with others, um, and hopefully, you know, creating creating products that make the world a better place and everybody's life a better better life. And at the same time, of course, uh, you know, hoping to make good returns for our investors. And and you've been part of this for many many years too. So it's not like you got done with first and this was the only thing you're doing. You've been a, a part of this for uh, well over a decade, I believe, right? Yep, yep. So I've been affiliated with this firm since uh, 20, 2005, so fifteen years now. Um, and the two partners, uh, so it's me and two other uh, partners, uh, one I've worked with since 2005 and another I've known for 35 years since, I, since uh, we were in grad school together. So it's a small firm. We're just a little boutique, um, but uh, you know, it's, it's really fun to get to work with uh, you know, enterprising young teams that are uh, out there coming up with really creative ideas and uh, you know, adding, uh, making the world a better place. And Nick, we're going to wrap up with uh, one final question here uh, before we say goodbye to Don tonight. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Don, what ways are you planning to con- continue to positively impact youth post first? Yeah, so um, I actually I, I want to stay involved with first uh, as a volunteer. Uh, I, I had the opportunity this past season uh, before uh, kind of the COVID shut down to uh, be a reviewer at our first Lego League Junior event, which oh, cool. uh, I couldn't. I could never do that when I was president of first. They always thought it would scare the kids too much. So now, <laughs> um, 
but uh, I got to do that. And then I uh, actually got to attend two uh, first robotics competitions. And one, I was, I was uh, sort of a helper volunteer and I, I got to judge in another one in New Hampshire. And I had plans to go to the uh, Ontario district championship and I was going to judge at a Minnesota event, uh, but uh, COVID had other plans. So I, I didn't, didn't make it to either of those, but uh, still, still hope to stay involved as a volunteer and uh, you know, get the, get to see my adult friends that are part of first, but also uh, get to keep being inspired by the young people that uh, never cease to amaze me. Well, Don, we really appreciate your time this evening. And it's great to hear that you're still looking at being involved uh, in first and promoting STEM and uh, getting involved that way. So uh, really appreciate it. Once again, I want to say a big thank you to you. Thanks to Nick Jr. as well, too, for being our co-host for today. Uh, with that says, we wrap up today. Just a couple last things to wrap up with. Thank you to everybody who helped subscribe uh, or donate bits to the stream to keep fun, loud, live, and independent. We need your support to do so. You can do so at patreon.com forward slash first updates now or here on Twitch or soon coming on YouTube as we just got accepted for YouTube partnership program. Uh, thank you, of course, to everybody who's in our Discord. Go check it out, discord.gg forward slash first updates now. And check us out on social, both under uh, first updates now, fun FTC and fun Latum on the different social media channels. Uh, tomorrow, if you're in FTC, you can join us uh, for FTC Live starting at 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern. We'll be talking a lot more about programming. And Sean, our uh, lead host for that, will be driving us through there and talking a lot about uh, the new game coming up and what's going on for that. And of course, find out more what's going on first updates now through all of our different channels. So, uh, Don, thank you so much once again. Uh, anything else uh, you want to promote, talk about, plug before we let you go here today? No, thank you guys both so much. It was uh, great talking to you. And uh, again, love the first community. So, it uh, was nice to have the opportunity to reconnect with everyone and hope everyone's safe and uh, stay safe. And, uh, you know, it's just nice to, nice to reconnect with everyone. So yeah, take absolutely. care. Thank you, Don. Yeah. Thank you so much. Now with that said, everybody, we appreciate you tuning in once again, either live or on YouTube or through podcasts under first updates. Now we'll see you next time on fun. Talk to you then. Good night, everybody. Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. Thanks to all of our co-executive producers on Patreon and Tier 2 Plus subscribers on Twitch, keeping fun loud, live, and independent.